And as riots crackled through his cities, the northern white man came to realize the depth of his confusion. People like Agnes Myers, Roy, uh, president of the board of the NAACP, and other white liberals and friends have cautioned against having a major demonstration for civil rights this summer. How do you... Well, it's our position in the NAACP that the opponents of civil rights legislation uh, left no doubt as soon as the president spoke. In fact, they didn't wait for him to speak. They began announcing their opposition and what they intended to do. Uh, they were going to filibuster. They were going to hold up uh, appropriation measures. They were talking, scaring the country that they weren't going to get a tax cut on account of civil rights. They're doing all the boogeyman stunts. And if they're going to use Washington as their base of operations for opposition to this bill, we don't see anything wrong with using Washington as our base to uh, indicate support for this bill. And in my estimation, this march is going to be a 100% outpouring of the disgust and distress of uh, black Americans and white liberals over the way the Congress has handled this bill. We testified uh, before the House and, and suggested universal suffrage. I mean, there's just no reason why a person is not 21, he can't vote. He can go into the Army whether he can read or write. Yeah, okay, so why shouldn't he be able to vote? And uh, this is no sign that the person isn't uh, intelligent, that the person doesn't have some basic intelligence. But because of discrimination and other conditions, sure. uh, many of these people haven't had an opportunity to get an education. And I think they should have uh, the right to vote. And th this is very basic. No president has recommended a bill of this scope before, mm -hmm. regardless of how we who suffer uh, may feel its limitations. And, and I think we ought to work with that. I think that in any such demonstration as the march, which is planned, you would expect a um, loud outpouring of uh, cries, of uh, fears from many, many people who don't want it to take place, uh, who are afraid that something might happen. But it seems to me that it reflects a lack of understanding of the nature of the times in which we are living. The fact that Negroes all over the country are concerned and are aroused and must express their feeling. They've waited a hundred years, and that's too long to wait. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Eddie Murphy. By all stretches of the imagination, uh, I shouldn't be here. And I'm not talking about apartheid, I'm just talking about my house. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to watch anything like him, nor was anyone like him allowed in my house. <laughs> and so I remember the first time I watched Raw and Delirious. Eddie, Eddie. You, Eddie. <laughs> that was one of the moments I distinctly remember where for the first time I saw someone out there that saw us. And so I want to say to you, thank you very much, Eddie Murphy, because I am part of your legacy, and I'm here today. But what about white friends and liberals who have worked in these organizations for many years who now say, look, uh, let's not go this fast. Let's not... Uh, we don't have people like that. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Our telephone is ringing with white people who want to get into the march. We don't judge our friends on the basis of the color of their skin. We judge them on the basis of the fact uh, of whether or not they are willing to go all the way with us. If they are not willing to go all the way, then they are not friends of ours. Now, we've said that these are interracial organizations, but you five gentlemen are Negroes. You are assuming the leadership, and you are asking white liberals and white friends to go along with the Negro speaking for himself rather than speaking through white surrogates. I would like to make this point, um, because I think there is a misconception that uh, any white people who happen to serve on your boards or committees are therefore automatically there Dictator. to exercise control Sorry. and restraint. Yeah. This is not the experience of the Urban League. There are many white people who serve on our boards who are asking for more militancy. I speak for the National Urban League at their insistence, not at my demanding, because they feel that a Negro is best able to express the hopes and the longings of his people. 
We're not going to show you Jeff Johnson waving a flag. We're not going to show you Jeff Johnson kissing babies. We're not going to show you Jeff Johnson doing anything because you already know what Jeff Johnson can do. Tomorrow, vote Jeff Johnson, the name you know. That sound white enough? That was very white. Yeah, that's chilling, actually. I'm just scared myself. <laughs> we ought to be clear that there is a desire on the part of Negroes for self-expression uh, through leadership of... Uh, uh, civil rights organizations. This is important because Negroes have been denied that self-expression for so many years. But this does not mean in any sense of the word, as far as I'm concerned, that white persons who are sincere cannot participate and cooperate. Exactly. And I think it's very important to have this participation. I think it would be very dangerous and even tragic if the struggle in the United States for civil rights degenerated to a racial struggle of blacks against whites, so to speak. Amen. It is a tension between justice and injustice, and we enlist consciences in the struggle. We appreciate the participation in this movement of white persons of goodwill, and we have many of them, fortunately, and I think uh, the number's growing every day, and this helps to keep the struggle on the level that it should be on. Sure. As far as I can understand you gentlemen, you. This is not a racist march. This is a march of aroused Americans who want to demonstrate and assume their rights to petition their and Congress want witness. and want witness, witness and support the president's uh, civil rights legislation. The attorney general would uh, seem to disagree with you in terms of his testimony uh, for Congress. He says that the most disturbing thing for Negroes is uh, the public accommodation segregation. The, the truth of the thing is, is that it's a vicious circle. Unless people are adequately educated, they can't possibly find uh, good jobs. And unless people can find good jobs, they can't buy good housing, which puts them in good neighborhoods where they can get a good education. So instead of being one major thing, it's a, it's a group of things. Yes, that's true. But it seems to me, of course, that the public accommodations matter, which is now being batted around in the Senate Commerce Committee, is the most abrasive and pervasive of the aspects of a Negro's life. Every time he steps out of his front door in the morning until he comes home at night, he runs the risk, and some of them don't run a risk, they run the certainty of this kind of denial and humiliation and mistreatment. And sometimes in the South, as you well know, yeah. in many subtle ways, you walk into a store and there's you're ahead of the, you're the next one to be waited on, but three white people come up and they get waited on first. This is a matter, the Negroes meet this. They, they, in many places they would have to ride on the back of the bus. And they do want a Coca-Cola and can't get it. Now these seem small things, but then I think the Attorney General was talking about the things that rub people the wrong way and make them say, oh, let's get rid of it, you know. And, you know, there are other areas of life which are very subtle, but which are not even being covered in the bill. And then there's some pronounced ways. I'm just thinking of the fact that you drive through the South. Yes. In some states, you can't even stop at the restrooms. And this is humiliating to women, you know, and, and it's very... And of course, uncomfortable. Well, it's yes. very uncomfortable, yeah. but it's, it's one of these little daily things. But I think that there are two areas that should be covered, you know, and that's the question of the voting bill. I don't see why we can't have universal suffrage for all Negroes. I mean, I really don't see why it has to be just a sixth grade educational level because that's a device and I think we were talking beforehand about how many the student people would be covered. The Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is putting a great deal of its effort on uh, voting, isn't it? Yeah, well, we just, yeah, we have a great program now. Cast your vote for Jeff Johnson. Good old Jeff. A name that you can trust. A name that you know. Jeff Johnson. Why you no vote Jeff Johnson? He the name you know. Go down vote for Jeff. Jeff Johnson, the name you know. Hey, you eating the green and you on the cornbread. Put that down and cast your vote for Jeff Johnson. The name you know. You know it's good. Jeff is good. Just like them greens. Jeff and greens. When you think greens, think Jeff Johnson. Well, we just, yeah, we have a great program now, and I think, in the Delta of Mississippi, but Roy might want to amplify on just how many people would be covered by sixth grade well, education. Well, the, the literacy test yes. bill, you know, we agreed, uh, well, we estimated, we couldn't, uh, that not more than 100,000 Negroes would be added to the rolls under the literacy test. You do realize right now, you are Arsenio Hall, <laughs> and I am Eddie Murphy. 
and the circle is complete because we have come to America. <laughs> I was sitting on the couch. I'll never forget that moment, sitting on a couch. <laughs> Tomorrow, vote Jeff Johnson, the name you know. And that changed my life. In this Meshuggah Navail, you want to vote for Jeff Johnson. I don't know why I got to come drive through here and tell you this. You should know who to vote for. We're there voting for Jeff because he's a good patient. It was seeing the future. It was seeing everything. Good patient. Are you crazy? What I was doing wasn't comedy. <laughs>